I always want to thank the Pardes Institute, that's P-A-R-D-S.org.il, for helping make this class happen. Okay, here we are, still life in a remote universe. Um, yes, and I agree with that request that was just made that everyone mute themselves so that uh, the sound of my own voice is always the sweetest thing, right? Um, so, so we're in the midst of this discussion of the roots of Zionism. And just to recall, last week we focused on what I would call the religious roots of Zionism, but not just the religious roots of Zionism, what we laid out was a structure which is gonna continue to follow us um, as we go all the way through, which is the two elements that I see as the foundational frames for Zionism. There's that problem solving element and there's the visionary or messianic element. And if you recall, the problem solving has much of its roots in the either modern conception of the Jewish problem, which we've spoken at length and it will return to us today about how emancipation in many ways posed that problem because the Jews no longer fit into modern European society. But it also has an older iteration where if Zionism is a problem solving movement, then the fundamental problem is exile itself. We saw that beautiful piece from the Maharal, which I hope you recall, um, about how exile is an unnatural state and therefore it itself necessitates redemption. And that idea of necessity is gonna to return to us as well today. I want you to keep your eye on it. So that's the sort of like problem solving piece that we're using as a frame. The visionary or messianic, what we saw last week is the classic messianic is built in in a very subtle way for secular Zionism, but in a very front loaded way than um, for um, very uh, front loaded like for religious Zionism. Sorry, I had a request to make uh, Deborah the co-host. One second, please, for the uh, technical. Here, hang one second. Um, where is, I just gotta find you, Deborah. Wait there, I'm the other. I'm the other community education. Yeah, yeah, I just had to find it. There you go, hang on. Boom. Okay, you're there. Um, okay. So, so the, the uh, visionary messianic element um, has an obvious life within religious Zionism, although remembering that religious Zionism will essentially remain a bit player until 1967, um, but it will have its impact on secular Zionism. We'll see more of that today. So that's kind of um, quickly touching where we were last week. What I wanna talk about today is a fundamental tension, which exists not only in Zionism, in all the Torah and frankly is expressive of one of the fundamental elements of life itself, which is the tension between klal and prat, right? This tension in between the particular and the universal or the all embracing. Um, because that tension, you know, the Zohar says it's the tension that the soul comes into the world in order to reconcile. It. And it's a tension which is always bound up with the redemptive instinct within Am Yisrael. Like you, the, probably the most obvious expression of it in Torah, even though you can find it in many places, is this strange notion that there's only one God who happens to also be the national God of Israel, right? I mean, you have this sense that, right, you say to Am Yisrael, like, is your God? Yeah, but there's only one God? Right, so he's everybody's God. No, he's our God. <laughs> Wait, we try this again. If there's only one God, he's your God? Yeah, but then he's everybody's God. Well, yes, but no, you see my point. Is that built into the entire sort of framework of the Torah is this tension between the particular and the universal. And it's gonna have a specific expression here in our discussion in 19th century Europe. Because 19th century European society itself is struggling between what I would call the parochial and the cosmopolitan instincts, right? And we're gonna see that the um, parochial will find its strongest expression within nationalism. Although all along with that will be a lot of the racial theories that we touched a little bit about with the polygenism of Voltaire, if you recall, at the end of last semester. And the, but that's going to the, really be embodied in our discussion today in nationalism, that parochial sense that, that um, the unit of measure for history, for culture, for, for even for the shaping of meaning is a national unit as opposed to the universalists, which will say, and universalism is funny, right? On one hand, the unit of measure for, for history, meaning, culture, et cetera, is all humanity. That means that it's the individual plays a very important role as opposed to the nation. 
So there, there's a lot of uh, cross currents, but essentially for our discussion, we're gonna see this tension between nationalism and the more cosmopolitan movements of socialism, communism, you know, et cetera. Um, up until now, we've at least touched on a few places where this tension comes up. And I wanna just get them on the board so we can appreciate our discussion today. I didn't actually say it outright, but our discussion today is gonna to be about uh, Moshe Hess and the work which is considered sort of at least post facto by many scholars as one of the earliest works of what we then call Zionism. It was a work called uh, Rome and Jerusalem. It's gonna take us a while to get there because I wanna understand it when we do. And Hess has a rich life before it becomes one of the heralds of Zionism as we call them. So, so in order to do that, I wanna put a couple of the pieces in the place because we haven't learned about this part of modernity as a whole. We jumped into Zionism. There's a little bit of context. Um, this tension between the, the particular and the universal for the Hasidim, who are a major force in European Jewish life, primarily Eastern European, but I wanna get the full picture before we go any further. Um, they see the answer to the Jewish question as sort of a, a national spiritual solidarity and a messianism, this hope for redemption. They therefore tend to belong to the more particularist element of the, let's just call it a Jewish perspective, right? They're not looking for, except in the sort of far, far future for a universal redemption. Their vision is national, the one body. This is very familiar to us today because a lot of the language of the Hasidim has been absorbed into our common religious language. Um, just let me know if the folks are still out there, like wave or, or make some noise or something. It's just the, the total silence is a little bit intimidating, I have to admit. Um, so along with the Hasidim, we also have the uh, sort of more orthodox religious world, which we haven't really discussed at all. But for now, what I'm going to do is lump, oddly enough, orthodox and the reform movement together. And we'll touch on the reform movement a little bit today in the sense that, thank you, Shelley, for the thumbs up, uh, in, the, in the sense that, um, that both the thing that orthodoxy and reform have in common at this stage, of like say the 19th, mid 19th century, mid to late 19th century, is that they're both oddly enough assimilationist movements. In their own way, and I know it might sound strange to call orthodoxy an assimilationist movement, but in their own way, both of them are looking to assimilate into a larger society by transforming the national life of the Jews into the religion of Judaism. Now it's not that such a thing as a foreign import, but it is to a certain degree to make it the mosaic faith, either the orthodox version or the reform version, is an assimilationist move because then I can take German of the Orthodox persuasion or a German of the Reform persuasion, but notice it's an assimilationist move and therefore in many ways is a more universalist tendency. That's why if you're familiar, we're not going to discuss it now, but just to put on the table things that people are familiar with, if you're familiar with the tendons that exist within Orthodoxy, one of the most profound is, is how do you reconcile between the particularism that sees the Jews as the chosen people, that sees the Torah as the sole source of truth, fill in the blank for how you define a particular of orthodoxy, and yet it's um, striking ability to function within a universalist society. In, in many ways, the Haredi world has a much easier time working within the bounds of modern Israel than the Dati Limi world, which is attempting to reconcile and, and, and synthesize and come up with some holistic vision. The Haredi world just wants to find its right place. Um, so for our picture, the Hasidim are much more removed and still invested in this sort of uh, national solid, spiritual solidarity and the hope for redemption. They also happen to be in Eastern Europe where emancipation has not quite made the inroads that it's made in Western Europe at this stage of our story. Then we have orthodoxy and reform, which I'm going to call assimilationist movements because they're attempting to sort of like refocus Jewish life as a religious life, which can be French Jews, German Jews, American Jews, fill in the blank. And last but uh, certainly not least, we haven't discussed the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. We're really going to touch on it directly next week. Um, but these are going to be the intellectuals who are struggling with the Hasidim in Eastern Europe and also the Orthodox in Western Europe. Um, and they're looking at this stage 
certainly in Western Europe, to um, achieve emancipation and to assimilate into European society on a much more grand scale. Western Europe, they're the inheritors of Modus Mensen that we spent the last section of last semester speaking about. In Eastern Europe, we'll see that they become the sort of fertile bed for secular Zionism. We're not there yet. Okay, so those are the pieces. And we have to add to this tension between the particular and the universal and the roots of Zionism, a new profile. And that profile is going to be uh, what I'll call the radical Jew. Maybe familiar with people today. Um, but the radical Jew is an idealistic youth, right? Who is going to strip the traditional garb and sort of expressions off of the messianic drive, which gives life to much of religious existence, and clothe it in the philosophical, social, economic theories of their day. And this radical Jew is probably best embodied for our story by Moshe Hess. So before I get into Moshe Hess, questions or comments on that bit of an introduction, which is hopefully helping to ground us where we are, you can either do it verbally or you can write them into the chat. I just want to pause for a second to make sure that people are with me. Um, Michael? Uh, yeah, I'm from. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. So um, this, this may be too broad a thing, but is, is there anything particularly different about Jewish nationalism and the general nationalism of the, of the 19th century? Is there something special? So we're going to meet Jew. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I'm, 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 that's it. So we're going to meet Jewish nationalism for the first time, really, at the end of this class. Some of the writings of Hess is, like I said, um, Rome and Jerusalem. And, and, and we'll discuss it then. My short answer for now is, um, on one hand, Jewish nationalism is like every other nationalism. On the other hand, because the roots of Jewish particularism are bound up with a universalist perspective, I mean, who is the national progenitor of the Jewish people? Who's our forefather? Abraham Avinu? Don't think too hard. Well, Avraham Avinu, right? And he becomes Avraham, right, when he becomes Avraham when God names him what? Avhamon Goim, the father of many peoples. You can't get a better expression of the tension I'm speaking about than that. Our national progenitor, the ultimate particularism, is a universalist figure. And so therefore, the thing that really differentiates between Jewish nationalism and, and others, potentially, is the universalism, which is its mission. We're going to speak about that, because that's why I introduced this tension between the particular and the universal. So stay tuned. Very good. Other questions, comments, people, things you want to put out there? You can do it in the chats as well as, as speaking out. All right, you'll stop me, Zat Hashem, as we go along. We got somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just, just one, one quick. We're not hearing you. It says your bandwidth is low. Oh, sorry, Mike. Th this is being, you, this is yes. being recorded, right? Correct. This, so I'll be able to play it back later because I can't write as fast as you can talk. <laughs> and I, I wish I had taken, um, I wish I'd taken shorthand, but it's okay. Um, one other okay. thing occurs to me, some of the terms that you use, you know, this is, I guess, a sign of what has happened in our society. You know, I, I apologize if I'm offending anybody, but when you say radical Jew, do you know, my brain thinks hilltop youth. <laughs> so, you know, well, that, that, so. Yeah, well, because like, radical is always defined in relationship <laughs> to whatever the mainstream conservative standard format is. Right. So that's not so a fair association. Right. I just have to like remind myself that these terms, they, you know, they're. They well, I'm going to explain exactly what the radical Jew is momentarily yeah. in the in the mid okay. uh, 19th century. Right. Okay. All that, right. That's fine. Good. Yep. Right. We're good. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna forge forward. And again, people have questions or comments. You can throw them into the chat if I don't hear you. Okay. So who was Moshe Hess? Moshe Hess, or Moritz, as really known in his younger years, is born in 1812 in the city of Bonn. So he's born into Germany, remembering that Germany at this point is part of the Napoleonic Empire. Because um, from 1795 or so to 1814, Napoleon's troops had conquered most of Western and Central Europe. 
And in doing so, we didn't speak about him, but I'm hoping that your general world history at least gives you some familiarity. And in doing so, they'd thrown open the gates of the ghetto wherever they went. Good, bad, or otherwise, that was part of what Napoleon did. He brought the ideals of the French Revolution where he was. And after centuries of cultural confinement, right, a, a personal freedom, economic opportunity, and of course, the liberal ideals of the day became available to way more Jews than Moses Mendelssohn ever could have imagined. Because as we spoke about, Mendelssohn had these sort of very high flown ideas, but they were extremely elitist just because, practically speaking, the conservative social structure would not emancipate the Jews, if you recall all the struggles of Mendelssohn's day. He took Napoleon to destroy the social structure and rebuild it in his own image that would allow the Jews real emancipation. But the thing is, is that, of course, Napoleon is defeated in 1815, right? And with his defeat comes what's known as the Congress of Vienna. Now, the Congress of Vienna is a discussion under itself. We're not going to go into it right now, but just know two things. First of all, it was by and large a reactionary process. Um, I don't know why you would be seeing Mindy, not Mike, but if you, um, if you right click the picture of me, you can pin my picture to your video. Mike, That's you're not the seeing a picture of you. There is no picture of you. She's in the center and she's on the side also, and there's no picture of you. Oh, there yeah. you are. Okay. Now you. I don't know how to... Right. Now you. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I, what I would do as long as my picture is there, if you right if click it, frozen, it, it will give you. Frozen, it'll... But you're there. In what? The... You're frozen. You're not moving, but you're there. Oh. I'm sorry, it's uh, bandwidth issues. Um, okay, but we're forging ahead. If it gets too difficult for people, you let me know and we'll try to, to work something out. But um, so Napoleon's defeat, 1815, leads to a restructuring of Europe from what's known as the Congress of Vienna. Um, and like I said, it's its own discussion if you wanted to get into the depth of it. But the two things we need to know for our story are number one, it was by and large reactionary movement, the four powers of Europe that had defeated Napoleon, an aspiration to turn back the clock to the monar monarchical, religious, conservative society that he had destroyed. Truth of the matter is, they didn't really succeed, but that, that's not our issue right now. Our issue is that that was the goal. That was number one. And number two, they created this concept of balance of power within Europe. It was really out of the Congress of Vienna that there was a of um, self-conscious commitment to the idea that the goal of European foreign policy on the behalf of all powers should be to prevent any one state or empire, because they're really empires at this point, of becoming too strong. And the idea of balance of power will stick around from basically the next 100 years until it, of course, blows up in their faces in World War I. Um, so the, those two pieces, of those two pieces right now, what really matters for us is this um, attempt to roll back the clock. Because for the Jews, when the Rhineland, in particular for our story, where Moshe Hess is living, is annexed to Prussia, King Frederick William III wants to revoke emancipation from the Jews. And in fact, he does legally revoke emancipation from the Jews. They had this progress on Napoleon, um, and ruling back. I see someone made a comment like a fledgling EU. The EU is actually a conscious attempt to create a new model rather than balance of power. It's an actual union, right? And, and that's a discussion we can have at another time. But here, Hess is born into a world in 1812 where his parents' generation had tasted the economic freedom, the personal liberties that came with the opening up of the ghettos and then had it taken away. And that provoked a crisis, which for many people who couldn't bear the notion of sort of returning to a degraded state, having really sampled the freedom of European society, many of them chose baptism. And a lot of famous names, this is when, you know, the, the children and grandchildren of, of uh, Moses Mendelssohn, many of them converted, as we spoke about at the uh, end of last semester, it was during this crisis. If you're familiar with um, Heinrich Hein, the sort of famous poet, who was part of the Young Germany movement, a very important poet in German history, who was born a Jew and famously said that, the, that baptism was the um, price of entry into European culture. And so therefore took it. Um, and 
a lesser known but important figure, Heinrich Marx, who was, of course, Karl Marx's father, changed his name and converted on the very same day. He went from Heschel to Heinrich and from a Jew to a Christian on the very same day. There were, however, of course, knowing the Jews, right, meaning those are the people that jumped for the universalism. They said that they, they took the notion that in order to be part of the emancipated, enlightened European society, you have to check your particularist culture at the door, and they went for it full on through baptism. Right? There were others who, however, went in the opposite direction and said, well, the solution is to become more of a Jew, and that's actually what Moshe Hess's family did. They became much more fiercely attached to their religion, and therefore he grew up in a home of deep religiosity. Nevertheless, you, you know, you can't shut the, the barn door after the cow got out. Um, and, and the ideals of the French Enlightenment, as well as the German Enlightenment, and the general culture of um, modernity were already part of the, almost like I say, the air that he breathed. Um, and like so many other idealistic young men, um, he was being moved by the waves of of myth nationalism and romanticism that were swirling in Germany in his day. We'll speak a little bit more about that. But what basically bottom line in a story which I'm sure many of us are familiar with, his father wanted Moshe to enter the family business and he said no way. He had no clear idea of what he wanted to do, but um, his longing was to serve humanity. That's a very important piece of his character. From a young age in his writings, and his own sort of like writings about himself, he was moved by the desire to help the poor, to liberate the oppressed, right? But above all, not to make money. He saw the whole way of life into which he'd been born, which for his father was survival, as a bourgeois egotism of the most disgusting type. And that's uh, a story which has returned to itself in many ways in the time in which we live. So what did he do? He wandered. He left his home and basically starved. I mean, obviously he lived, so he didn't completely starve, but he wandered in poverty from England to Holland to France. He was in Paris in the wake of the revolution of 1830, if people are familiar with it, when many of the sort of uh, social advances that had been taken away after Napoleon was defeated, some of them were regained. It was a very heady time. Picture him there in the cafes of Paris, drinking coffee, discussing politics, dreaming of global revolution. And it was here in Paris in the early 1830s that he finally, or finally, he first uh, imbibed the radical social and economic ideas, really money of which came with his fellow German immigrants there who put themselves in self-imposed exile in France. The call of the day in this intellectual class that he joined was to fight capitalism in the form of abandoning individual enterprise and the ruthless competition that they claimed were destroying the body of humanity. And the dream that they longed to replace it with was a collective, right? There's this notion that a collective undertaking would release the energies of humanity in a planned and harmonious manner, bringing universal prosperity, justice, happiness, right? This is the foundational environment for socialism. In fact, one of the earliest radical socialists was fond of declaring that the very possession of private property was the root of all evil. And that justice and freedom would never be achieved without social and economic equality that depended on the complete abolition of inheritance and private property. Now you have to picture young Hess, who himself had sacrificed a life of at least economic comfort. He didn't leave his home in order to escape his Jewish confines. He left his home because he wanted to escape the capitalist environment. He's drinking all these ideas of wine, right? You have to add into this mix of the, the socialist notion, if you're gonna pick out any phrase to remember, just remember that phrase that the very possession of private property is the root of all evil. Add into this German idealism. Now it's not a class of philosophy, and if it were, we probably should better do justice to Jewish philosophy than non-Jewish. Nevertheless, in order to understand the environment of formation, really for Zionism as a whole, but certainly for Moshe Hess, we have to understand a little bit of the German idealist movement. Um, I went back and forth myself, spent way more hours than perhaps I should have reading up on Kant and 
and uh, Shishin, uh, Schiller, which was fun, but, but um, I'm going to hold back and just say a few things. First of all, the, um, the, the element that we want to trace out of Kant's thought, if you remember, Kant was a contemporary of Moses Mendelssohn. So we're talking about the end of 18th century. And, and Kant really lies at the base of German idealism. Even though one could say that he's a precursor to it, I'm not gonna get into all those debates about who belongs where and what philosophical school. But the phrase I want you to pull out from Kant's thought is that the basis for morality is the autonomy of will, right? Therefore, in a political sense, then everyone is an end unto themselves, and the only notion of a right moral society is a political life which is organized around the idea of, of um, sort of serving as a base for autonomous will. Right? Sounds nice. Society, oh, I gotta see a question from Israel. Yeah? Israel? Before I get too further, too much further into uh, Yeah, could you, I didn't, idealism? I, I didn't get the quote, the basis of morality is the autonomy, is the of, autonomy of the will, of, of the, the will, will itself. Yeah, We're meaning, it, um, I'll get to that question about socialists and religious at the same time. First of all, he wasn't religious. He abandoned his religion along with his, his parental home. Let's talk about Moshe Hess, but I wanna answer Israel's question first, and then we'll get back to Moshe Hess. Um, the, if you remember, Kant was the one who defined enlightenment as, um, as uh, an escape from knowledge, escape from the state in which someone else's will is imposed upon you, right? And so therefore, his idea of morality is the freedom of your own will. Well, that sounds nice, but then to create a society within which individual can be free. And that's the early enlightenment notions that we saw with Mendelssohn's thought and Kant's thought. But that's only the beginnings of German idealism will go. Because, um, we're going to see that, that um, the students of Kant and even some of his contemporaries really struggle with this idea of the individual will as opposed to a collective national will. And, and, and we'll often see actually real freedom as the embodiment of collective will. And this is where the more romantic notions will start to replace the intellectual notions of the enlightenment. And I don't want to go, like I said, too far into the philosophical distinctions, also because my grasp of German idealism is not good enough to do anything other than really confuse you. Um, but the idea that a political collective can express will and not just serve as a platform everyone's individual freedom, but rather actually can articulate a will which can only be expressed on the national scale is, becoming, is going to become a very important part of European thought. And in fact, it's a backbone of what's known as European Romantic Nationalism. Like Avram asked the question at the beginning of the class, how is Jewish nationalism different than other nationalisms and how is it the same? One of the ways in which it will be very closely aligned is the sense that there is such a thing as a national will. And that the state or let's just say the collective, because state is not necessarily the given at this stage of history. The collective has the ability to express will on a level that the individual lacks. So here's Hess, sitting in the cafes of Paris, absorbing on one hand these notions of um, the evils of private property. To answer the question that, uh, that Gold asks, he is no longer religious, he's abandoned the house of his father in every sense, literally he's lived out, religiously he's abandoned it, and economically he's rejected any support from his father at this stage. And in addition to these socialist notions, he's also absorbing certain elements of German idealism, the importance of the freedom of the will, the question of what scale that will can find best expression on. Is it the individual? Is it some national units? Or is it some sort of universal sense that you know that they're after universal justice and freedom right into this of course in any discussion of german idealism we have to put hegel and and here there's just a couple of things 
we have to understand about Hegel in order to really appreciate where this story is going. Um, more than anything else, you have to understand in Hegel is a sense of inevitability. Right? In his uh, lectures in the philosophy of history, Hegel sort of paints a picture of an unfolding progression through time. He sees it, European that he is, um, from the Greco-Roman to the European, and he sees it as a progress from the one person having the authority to rule over others to the idea that a class of people has the authority to rule over others, and ultimately to the idea that no one has natural authority to rule over anyone else. Therefore, all men are free. Notice he is, by the way, saying men because he's still a product of his own society. Um, this is not just a um, philosophical, well, I should say just philosophical. It's not just a, a read of history. It's an idealist's read of history, meaning it's a cosmic assertion that, that the world itself has what has been translated as a world spirit, which is moving toward self-awareness. And that self-awareness finds its expression in the world through people's rational knowledge. This is the, um, who was supporting Hess, he was living hand to mouth. He was working as a journalist in order to just even pay very barely his bills. Sitting in these cafes, drinking wheat coffee and being very hungry, right? But absorbing the ideas. And in particular, this Hegelian idea, don't miss the importance that the world is inevitably moving toward freedom, rational knowledge, Right, that this is a cosmic movement of the universe coming to awareness of itself in this sort of like almost mystic sense, even though God is not being spoken about as a theist sense of a God outside of the world, but rather the world itself is coming to consciousness. And because of that process, there is also inevitability of the collision between social, intellectual, economic, and political forces. Right, this is if people are familiar with. Hegel was the one who first really formulated this idea of the dialectic, that you have a thesis, an idea or a thing, it, which through opposition brings into the world its antithesis, and the two clash and produce a new thesis. That's that process of synthesis. Was that a question somebody was putting out there, or was that just background? Okay. Um, uh, the, the, I see a question out there. I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, I saw. When does the collective will become the coercive will? We're going to get to that in the 1860s. <laughs> Don't worry, we're getting there. Um, the but for now, you're talking about I, idealism, right? They're they're not yet these young men in the cafes. They're not yet empowered to act upon these ideas. They're trying to conceptualize exactly what the world could be. Oh, it's a great question I see from Aviva. She's sensing that there's an association between Hegel and Spinoza's notion, notion of God or nature. And you're going to see momentarily that the first work that Hest tries to write is a synthesis of some Spinozan and Hegelian thought along with his socialist notions. So yeah, there is this idea that, that the world itself is evolving in our language, right? And that its evolution is expressed through the spread of rational knowledge, which brings freedom to all humanity. Now, you'll, if you are paying attention, you'll see that this is the base of all optimism within Western secular culture. But the very optimism of Western secular culture is founded on this idea of progress. And progress is usually defined by the spread of knowledge and freedom. And it won't be really until maybe the interwar period between World War and World War II, or for much of the world, the sort of post-World War II period, in which that notion collapses, economic prosperity will continue to be a standard of measure. But even today, if you look what's happening today with the world collapse of, I don't want to be overdramatic, but let's say the contraction of world economy, a lot of people's reaction to what's happening now is that the secular world has no longer any standard by which to measure progress. Certainly not freedom of the world because we have this retrograde motion in many places in the world toward a more authoritarian form of government. Knowledge with the postmodern problems has become itself problematic. And now the sense of like endless abundance and 
sort of an unstoppable progression toward more consumption has proven to be, let's just say less than stable. But we're way ahead of ourselves. For Hess, these notions of Hegel add a very important piece to his socialism because if there's an inevitability in the collision between the four of what must be and what is right now, nobody wants to be on the wrong side of history, right? The process of growth is, is perpetual struggle and in order to sort of, uh, to what's the word I'm looking for, express this world spirit, right? And, and for our story, I want you to sense the power of the secular messianism in Hegelian thought. What do I mean? It used to be that Jews, I mean, still today many say, but for Hess, it used to be he would say, even though the, the Messiah tarries, nevertheless, I shall wait. But now he's absorbing this notion that you don't have to wait. There's an, there's an inexorable progress of conflict between thesis and antithesis, which is going to produce a higher synthesis. And you can participate in the process of bringing about a world, not just which might be, but which must be. And of course, is universal. It's a world which is going to bring about a whole dawn of secular messianism. And that secular messianism holds a very important place in, in I wouldn't say all socialist and communist thought, but in, in, in much of it. So all over Germany, in, in truth is all over Europe, at least Western Europe, um, intellectuals are deeply influenced by Hegel. Students are seeking the sort of revelation of these ways of God or the absolute spirit in history, depending on what name you gave it. Schools of historiosophy are popping up. How do you read the story of the past as, as what we would call romantic myth, but it's secular, right? Um, and they're praying that history will now do the work that they've given up on the theology or even philo philosophical metaphysics to accomplish, right? And, and, and this sets the stage for a very important activism which is coming next. Because remember, this is still German idealism. Hegel and his fellow philosophers are mostly embedded in the academy and they're writing works of philosophy and metaphysics. What will happen, of course, who is the most famous in intellectual inheritor of Hegel's dialectic? Karl Marx. Karl Marx. And he, of course, is not an idealist. He's a materialist, which means he's all about the world that we actually live in, not one conceptual world which lies above that or is in the progress of unfolding. And we're going to see him appear in our story quite soon. So, um, oh, good. I have a question for clarification. I don't understand how secular messianism rose from the idea of progress. Well, I would say that progress is secular messianism. Progress means we're going somewhere better inevitably. And we don't need to believe that some redeemer is going to come according to some religious mythology and save us, the world is inevitably moving toward it. You understand, Barbara? Like, like we don't have to wait for the Messiah and the rebuilding of the temple and the return of the Jews to Zion and, the, and, the, and sacrifices. We're going to have food for everyone, you know, justice and, uh, and uh, rational, rational knowledge will, you know, will enlighten the whole world. But, that answer, yeah? No, but the idea of messianism is a religious concept, and you're telling me that they left religion. So uh, why are they even interested in the Mashiach? Why? Uh, well, they're not interested in the Mashiach in a religious sense, but, but you know what happens when you get rid of messianism? You lose hope. But why do they even have messianism if they left? Isn't, I associate messianism with religiosity. So if they left that, the Torah, why didn't they just leave the idea? They can have life without a Mashiach. Why is that still in their mindset? Well, first of all, you need to uncouple Messianism and, and, and Torah. Because Messianism yeah. is certainly within Western culture is this idea that there is a redemptive phase that humanity has not yet reached. That, that <laughs> life as it is now is not how it's meant to be. And that there's a better phase which lays ahead. Hegel and the German idealists, I would say, are an interim stage between classic religiosity. Remember, they come from a Christian culture, which is obviously a very messianic culture. That's an true. Stage. That Christianity is messianic. Right. They're, oh. they're an interim stage between classic religious messianism and 
why I would say postmodern secularism. Well, you're right. People don't, people just say, well, life is what it is. Life is. Or it's, life what, is. Or, or it's what you can make it, but there's no exactly. inevitability. And that's why I wanted you to sense the attraction because, uh, because for people are Jews like, like uh, Moshe Hess, who is a Jew, was raised a Jew in a religious home to yeah. live life without and, and was, was most captivated by the sort of um, moral ideals of redemption. So it is an easy fit to sort of strip away the husk, as he saw it, of religious particularism. Right. And, and that the a universalist yeah. vision of the salvation of all humanity, which is, in Hegel's terms, the articulation of the world's soul. You see how these things are resonant with a classic religious perspective of Messianism, but, but they've, you've lowered the bar of behavior. You don't have to keep the mitzvot anymore. Uh, and... Right. And you've taken away the particularism, which really bothered him, because he saw the particularism as bound up with the sort of unsavory economic behavior of Jews who were, by and large, very uh, serious capitalists at this point. Uh, interesting. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. And I see the comment here that perhaps Marx was their messiah. Well, you're about to see that that is the truth. Uh, or I would say Marx would have been Eliyahu, so to speak, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, because he was the harbinger of they never saw their messiah. But that's a, that's a discussion that lies ahead. Other questions or comments before we get back to the flow of Hess's life? Yeah, somebody. Marsha. Marsha. Yeah? I think Marsha has a question. Hi, Mike. Hi. Mike? I don't see your hand. I'm sorry. There you go. Yeah, I hear you, Marsha. Okay. Uh, well, you sort of answered the question, but I was going to ask how much at that, at this point, was uh, Moshe Hess's Jewish messianism, Jewish or just messianism? But I think you kind of so, answered that. And uh, at this point, he's he's striving to leave his Judaism behind. We'll see that that's not going to last. Uh -huh. But Mike, he married a non-Jew. Yeah. The after his father died. Yeah, after his after his father died. We're not there yet. Giving away the story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there is a story here. <laughs> And I think the other comment I wanted to make is, where would this have gone without Marx? I don't think, you know, because well, he wasn't, who, who was he really talking to? Who was Hess talking to or who was Marx? And talking? all the intellectuals at the university. I mean. Well, we'll get, we're gonna get there in 1848. We're gonna get there. You guys are, you guys are right on track. Your questions okay. are showing Prof. Hashem <laughs> that, we're, that we're, we're together. Other questions or comments before we, we get back into the flow? Yo, Abram. There's a wonderful picture I saw in one of the Yiddish papers, maybe the 1900, of, of Karl Marx, you know, with his hands up, splitting the Red Sea, bringing the Jews across. I guess that was more, that was his Jewish fundus. But that idea that Marx is like the Messiah. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it. Right. Yeah. No, no. Listen, to this day, the um, progressive left sees the ideals of um, this point, I'm not going to get into what their ideals are, but they see their ideals as messianic ideals. If you listen to um, the progressive left of the Jewish world, they have a messianic vision of, um, of rights, uh, even, even sort of the idea of intersectionality has, has deeply messianic overtones in, in terms of its commitment to universal justice, the sense of, of absolute human solidarity, you know, I'm not getting into how it actually plays out. I'm just simply talking about its, um, its momentum. And, you know, just to put one finger back down on, on what uh, Barbara said, is that I, I think that it's very hard for societies to live without hope. When you live in a world which is imperfect, the hope that it could be better is a very important motivator for your ability to live day to day. And more importantly for our story, for your ability to marshal people into collective action, which against their short-term interests. Remember, these guys are starving and sacrificing their short-term interests in order to achieve a long-term ideal. And, and you have to have some hope and belief that the world can change if you're going to convince people to do this. One of the great challenges of our leadership today, one of the breakdowns of popular democracy today, is that instead of, of marshalling the ability to convince our societies to sacrifice their short-term interests in pursuit of long-term goals, much of popular democracy is oriented toward catering to people's short-term interests. It's been interesting that the coronavirus has forced 
many of these democracies to do the opposite. Like we have to convince people to stay in the lockdown because they wanna keep their society alive. And even though the economic cost is high, that's a discussion that we could have in another time. I see another question here from, from uh, Aviva. Since Marx is father, uh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about Marx and his Judaism. We, you, guys are, you guys are dead on. So can I, I, all your questions are showing me that we're, that we're on the right track. And maybe if we just keep going, I'm, I'm gonna answer most of them. Yes, good. Ah, that's funny because the time lag allows me to just say whatever I want. Okay, um, so so after a few years of this sort of abject poverty, drinking wheat coffee, sitting in the cafes in Paris, is supporting himself, as I said, as a very part-time journalist, <sighs> young Moshe decides he's got to go home. He, he literally returns to Cologne on foot, right? His family now lives in Cologne, and, and he has to make peace with his capitalist father. And from his own account, he was received, you know, the prodigal son, returns home with open arms by both the uh, religious and very small C conservative family that he came from. His father was happy to make him a clerk in the family sugar refinery. And of course you can imagine that that ended in complete disaster. Less than a year that Moshe Hess was able to hold out as a participant in this capitalist system that he saw really as a vampire sucking the soul from humanity. Um, and within that year, he scraped together whatever he could enough to live for maybe a few months, and once away walked away from his father's house, this time for good. He was not to go home. And it was now 1937, and he's decided that he no longer wants to just um, sit on the edges. He wants to be part of the discourse, the intellectual world in which he lives. And he publishes a small and almost completely unknown work called The Sacred History of Mankind by a Young Disciple of Spinoza. Now, we're, we're not going to go into it. It's, I haven't read it myself, although I've read several secondary sources on it. It's wacky stuff. Um, but this, the title kind of says it all. Um, the, the sacred history of mankind, that's Hegel. This idea that, um, that uh, there is a spirit which humanity embodies through time and which evolves is a classic Hegelian thought. And the fact that he called himself a young dis uh, disciple of Spinoza, I think it was Aviva who noted, um, it was 1937. I think it was Aviva, Aviva who noted that- um, 18, that 1830, 1837. Oh, sorry, 1837. I said 19, you're right. 1830, very different year, huh? Um, so his central thesis is that in the beginning, humanity lived in what he calls an undifferentiated unity of spirit and matter, which if, familiar, if you're familiar with uh, sort of German idealism, that was one of its big challenges, the relationship between spirit and matter. And more importantly for our discussion in a condition of what he calls primitive communism, which preceded the invention of property. Now you have to remember that we live in a world in which property isn't a concept, it's a reality. So it can be very difficult to wrap the head around the idea that actually private property isn't necessarily an intrinsic, right? It, it is a social, construct. The idea that I, and leave aside the world, the fact that we live in a world full of things, the, the, the primary historical question of property was what? Agricultural land. Now, the idea that I could put a fence around a piece of land and declare it mine happened at a certain stage in, Jewish, in human history. And, and uh, the argument being made by the early socialists, pass amongst them, is that that was actually the great root of all evil. Right, and therefore, since humanity has drifted away from that state of primitive communism, again, where there was no property, his assertion is the task of modern humanity is to create a rational harmony of matter and spirit. Remember, originally it was a undifferentiated unity, infantile, but now we have the task of creating a rational harmony, what he calls social humanity, in which the evil institution of private property will at long last be abolished. And for the purposes of our story, this book published in 1837, right? The Sacred History of, uh, Sacred History of Humanity by a young disciple of Spinoza is incontrovertible proof that even at this early phase, Hess was a full-fledged socialist, which by the way, gives him a legitimate claim to be the, one of the earliest, if not the earliest German socialists, right? Um, now, coupled with that socialism, as we saw, is a complete dismissal of his Judaism. And at this stage, he has absorbed what I would call the worst elements of um, unconscious Christian anti-Semitism. Because in this work, he says that the progress of sacred history includes the Jews being superseded 
by Christianity, right? He thinks, and that's that Hegelian notion that, that each stage of history, right, has its purpose, gives birth to its fruit, and then is no longer, right? Uh, he's going by, yeah, as far as I know, he's going by Moshe Hess. And someone asked whether he keeps his name, but, um, but, but this is this Hegelian progression. Each thing serves its purpose in its time and then goes by the wayside. And Judaism should have gone by the wayside, which means what? He says to the Jews of his day, the people chosen by their God must disappear forever, that out of its death might spring a new, more precious life. This is the relationship between particularism and universalism, which he holds at this point, which is particularism served its purpose and it must give way to universalism. And at this point, it's, we're not gonna go into it deeply now, but it'll pop up several times, that universalism is the same as homogenization. Right? At this point in his thinking, the way to achieve universalism is to make everyone equal and the same, which means that the Jews are intrinsically problematic because we're a clannish, rather particular people. Now, we're going to see other attitudes on that come from him before the end of the class, but um, this, where this leads us in our story is this commitment to the abolition of private property and a dismissal of Judaism. In fact, the demand that Judaism disappear in order to help humanity progress um, are two principles that he shares with a fellow Jew or former Jew at this point, his contemporary and his ultimate collaborator, and that's Karl Marx, right? So I'm gonna introduce Marx and we're gonna see that Marx and Hess actually had a very close and then very antagonistic relationship. So Marx, is born only about six years after Hess. He's born in uh, 1818 um, in Trier in Germany. Um, he wasn't religiously Jewish, but he was ethnically Jewish. What do I mean? Um, his history, I mean, his maternal grandfather was a Dutch rabbi. His father's line had been the rabbis of Trier since 1723. His grandfather held that office last. And then his father, as I mentioned, actually before Marx is born, Right? When Jewish emancipation was removed in the Rhineland, like I mentioned at the beginning of class, his father converts. He changed his name from Heschel, sorry, Herschel to Heinrich, and he converts and joins the uh, Evangelical Church of Prussia, which is the state religion of Prussia at that time, um, and really considers himself sort of an enlightened man of European culture, abandons his Judaism, but, you know, it's not so easy. You can stop being Judaism, Jewish, but it's hard to stop being a Jew at this point in uh, European history. So Marx does receive a, a significant dose of Jewish ethnic culture, as we'll call it. So at the age of 17, Marx is now, it's October 1835, just two years before Hess publishes his first work. Marx goes to the University of Bonn. He's looking to study philosophy and literature. His father wants him to be a lawyer. Uh, but once he gets to Bonn, he gets involved with a group of radical thinkers who call themselves the Young Hegelians. Again, I want you to appreciate this Germanism is the intellectual environment of the day. That's in 1837. Now, the young Hegelians, Paul was Marx's father converted. Um, Marx's father comes before he's born, right before he's born, in fact. Um, remembering Marx was born in 1818, and Prussia is, is uh, emancipation is revoked, I think it took a year, so it was around 1816. Um, so, so his father converted a year or two before Marx was born. Um, so the the young Hegelians, this sort of um, intellectual society that Marx got involved in in 1837, same year that Hess publishes The Sacred History, um, are critical of Hegel's metaphysical assumptions, but they adopt his dialectic method of analysis of society. This is an important move because the move toward materialism. No longer for Marx is the question in the field of play ideas, he wants to directly analyze society. So Marx comes to Cologne in 1841, and that's when he meets Hess. Hess immediately falls under his spell, as apparently did many people who met him. Right? Um, and he writes, Hess, by the way, writes in a letter that was recorded, that was preserved. He writes about Marx to a friend. He's the greatest, perhaps the only true philosopher actually now alive. Dr. Marx, that is the name of my idol, is still a very young man and will strike the final death blow at medieval religion and politics. He combines philosophical depth with most biting wit. Imagine Rousseau, Voltaire, 
Olach, Lessing, Hein, and Hegel, not thrown together anyhow, but fused into a single personality, and you will have Dr. Marx. Like, you don't get any higher, um, any higher praise than that. Um, are you guys having trouble hearing me? I see the, the comment about, uh, about uh, bandwidth. Yeah, I, I will work to, to solve this problem. I tried to ether cable, I'm not sure what else to do. Um, so but what's interesting is that Marx, his influence on other people is not a surprise. What's interesting, however, is the fact that Hess had a profound impact on Marx. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the, um, the real place that we'll see this is actually in his socialism. But before we do that, there is um, one question about Marx that I do want to touch. We we'll get to the relationship between Marx and Hess, and that that um, is this sense that uh, you know we said Hess made a call for the chosen people to disappear in order to allow a new world to be born. That's that cosmopolitan element within Hess, um, and, and also his idealist philosophy, right? Um, because there shouldn't be a specific people anymore marked by distinct customs in a world of complete and undifferentiated human freedom. Marx, however, is not an idealist. He's a materialist. And therefore, his analysis of the Jews is a little bit more visceral and, frankly, more antagonistic. Marx writes in 1843, only a year or two after he gets to Cologne and meets Hess, um, he writes a, a pamphlet known as On the Jewish Question. It was specifically a response to uh, another German thinker, Bruno Bauer's analysis of the attempts by Prussian Jews to regain their emancipation. And it's significant in the history of Marxist thought because it's one of his first articulations of the materialist concept of history. He says that, that this emancipation that the Jews are trying to achieve on the political frame, that, that doesn't require the Jews to assimilate. Why? Because political emancipation is real freedom. The important to understand that about Marxist thought is that in Marx's mind, the only significant realm of conflict and struggle is economic. And political structures follow in their wake. There were this struggle for emancipation and the demand by the European that the Jews assimilate culturally in order to get political emancipation, says Marx, is a waste of everyone's time, right? Real economic, real emancipation is economic emancipation. That's the only true liberation. And in, or in eyes of Marx, in an economically liberated world, Judaism must disappear because it's, he, he says, he calls it the ultimate product of capitalism. I got a quote for you here. What's the secular basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the world religion of the Jews? Huckstering. What is this worldly God? Money. And that's why he says, final analysis, the emancipation of the Jews is the emancipation of mankind from Judaism. And these are not the only, what we would call anti-Semitic words that Marx has out there. Um, nonetheless, Marx's anti-Semitism, which one, I mean, it just begs the question of how much of this was his own struggle with his identity, but I, I can't psychoanalyze him from a distance. Um, these words and these sentiments didn't prevent Hess and many other disaffected Jews that were swirling through the cities of Central and Western Europe at this point from being swept up by the power of his thought of what eventually became known as dialectic materialism, Marxism, and his personality. So Marx and Hess will run on parallel tracks after their meeting in Cologne in 1842. They'll run on parallel tracks for a couple of years. They'll reunite in Brussels in 1845. Um, at that point, Marx has already formed his friendship with Friedrich Engels, and he's begun to develop the sort of framework of his economic theories that eventually are known as Marxism. And Moshe Hess has become one of the chief theoreticians of what's known as philosophical or true socialism. It's the idealist stance on socialism opposed to the materialist. Now, it's also important to note that, um, that Hess is known as a man of a singular purity of character at this point. He's sensitive to every form of injustice. He's passionate in his devotion to his philosophical principles, and apparently downright saintly in his everyday behavior, so much so that um, after his father dies, as Israel mentioned, he marries a non-Jewish prostitute in order, quote, to atone for the evil that society had done. Apparently he was happily married to the end of his days to her, um, 
but he, his character is such that his friends, and this is why I'm mentioning it, actually nicknamed him the communist rabbi, right? They, they had a sense that his purity of character and idealism was what a Jew ought to be. So what's the point of putting Hess and Marx together? Well, I'll tell you, people, scholars, at least, identify three primary influences in Marx's thought. There's agro dialectic, there's English economics, English Scottish, and then there's the utopian socialism, which was based in France and Germany. And since it was Hess that introduced Marx to that utopian socialism, we can say that he was a major contributor to Marx's thought. Yeah, Israel and Marcia, got a question there? There was a yeah, view, yeah, there was a view that Moshe Hess never became a communist, but stayed in socialism because yes. um, he broke with Frederick Engels when Engels was taking his wife Sybil to meet Moshe Hess and Sybil had an affair with Engels. And there was a speculation that that broke, he, after that he broke away and stayed in socialism and didn't get closer to communism. So much for being Could be, I mean, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, it sounds like a good scandal story. I can maybe should read up on it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but for the, for the, the arc that we're, we're painting here, what's important to understand is that Hess, where he remained was an idealist. And even though he will keep his association with Marx all the way through the first international in the, in the late 1860s, uh, we're right now in 1847, right? 1847, Europe is reaching a boiling point. What I mean, that, that the, the liberal ideas of the French Revolution that had been scattered like seeds all over Europe by Napoleon had been pushed back in 1815 with his defeat. But we've seen the Paris Revolution of 1830. We're seeing the, the sort of political struggles within the German states. And with this sort of like social boiling point, Marx decides that the underground organizations and the sort of secret meetings that had characterized socialists and communists up to this point were no longer sufficient. He needed to unite the working classes. And so he founds the Communist League in 1847. And then at, in the February of 1848, publishes, of course, the Communist Manifesto. Um, now, the last bit of the manifesto is actually oriented toward attacking this pure socialism that he had really encountered through Hess, so much so that he called Hess a feeble echo of French socialism and communism with a slight philosophical labor. Um, nonetheless, the fact that Moshe Hess had a significant impact on Karl Marx is a, is, a, is a point of interest in our history and brings us up to 1848. The year that the Communist Manifesto was published is also known in European history um, as the Spring of Nations, right? The, that spring, the dam which was holding back all the liberal forces of Europe basically burst, right? It's known, like I said, the, the Spring of Nations so the question of when did communism start? Officially, the Communist League is founded by Marx in 1847. Communism as an idea is quite a bit older, but as an official movement founded in Marx 1847, he publishes the Communist Manifesto in 1848. In that same year, only a few months after its publication, um, like I said, the dam burst on the liberal forces of Europe. It's the spring of nation, this is called the people's spring, springtime of the peoples or the year of revolution. You know, basically, it's the most widespread revolutionary wave in European history. And it's very hard to characterize. Because on one hand, you have ardent nationalists, people that are seeking the liberation of their national um, units, their nation from the international empires, Austria, Hungary, of, you know, et cetera, like the, they want self-determination. You also have diehard communists who are looking for world revolution and the sort of transformation and freedom of humanity, but everybody's looking to overthrow the existing order. That's the key that unites all these various movements. 1848 is a mess. In many ways, historians characterize it as a failure. But I want to understand just a few um, points that occurred in this sort of battle against life as it was in Europe, and then we'll place Hess in it. Um, because 1848 is also a significant moment in the consolidation of the nation state. 
It's not finished yet. Really, World War I, in many ways, will be the last gasp of a nation state, although it's not completely done until World War II and the formation of the United Nations, the, na the word itself, you know, ought to, ought to give you the indication of the end of colonialism. But, you know, if we talked about 1648, if you remember the Treaty of Westphalia and, and, and the very important shift within European political culture, that you could have an identity of a citizen or a member of the nation, which wasn't religious, but was rather national, it was no longer Protestants and Catholics. You could have Germans, some were Protestants, some were Catholic. You could have French, some were Huguenots, some were Catholics. That was the beginning, 1648, of the formation of the nation state as the structure of European history. The sort of next phase of that is in 1848 with this revolution of, of uh, this sort of 1848 or the spring of nations. And it, there are a few things, like I said. Number one. Mike? Mike? Yeah. Hi, it's yes. Barbara. Okay, I'm a little lost. We were talking about socialism, and he was a true socialist. Yes. And all of a sudden, you were throwing around the word communism. I'm like, whoa, wait, when did that start? And so, could you? Uh, I'm lost. How we went from socialism uh, listen, to communism? Eddie, I, 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 I appreciate that. The, the at this stage. I don't think that uh, um, there, there are definitely differences between socialism and communism. I don't mean to, to deny that distinction. This stage, I think our discussion, what's important to note is more what unites them and what divides them. Right? Okay. Both of them are committed to, to an internationalist, global transformation of humanity. Both of them are opposed to private property as a foundation for the social and economic order. Um, and, and both of them at this point are revolutionary movements because they see the conservative socioeconomic and political structures of their day as barriers which have to be destroyed in order to renew the world. But and, and, and the distinctions now, between them right now are going to take us astray. What? Okay, in other words, right now you're using them inter... either way, it doesn't Somewhat matter. interchangeably, yes. Yeah, for our purposes, although you are correct, they are not the same thing. Um, Okay, I appreciate the losing the thread. So, so where are we right now? You know, what, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out of 1848. I'm gonna give you thank you for for calling me to task there, Bob. I'll give you the arc where we are because I want to get as to his role is his transformation. Because really, 1848 is his turning point. Why? Because 1848 was a failed revolution. All these idealist notions of socialism, or the more materialist Marxist ants, and even many of the nationalist attempts. There's a revolutionary wave, and then more or less a collapse. And out of this collapse of all this idealism for Hess comes a new conception. A new conception, and truth is, it's a conception which he later says had occurred to him already back in 1840. You remember we spoke last week about the Damascus blood libel and how there was an international outcry over the treatment of these, um, these Jews that were accused of the blood libel of Damascus. And the key it was an international outcry because Hess records in his journal how he'd reacted painfully to that incident only eight years before this failed revolution. And for the first time, he began to wonder whether the universalist solution that he was seeking for the liberation of all humanity would actually cure the problem of the Jews as well. So that idea that perhaps his universalism wouldn't help the Jews started to bubble up in 1840 with the Damascus Blood Bible. And then when he sees the failure of these movements he judges to be a failure. In 1848, he actually falls back on what had always been a bit of a difference between he and Marx. And, and that was, he began to condemn cosmopolitanism, this idea that there were no nations, there were not things that divide humanity, as basically an unnatural suppression of the very real differences between nations and races. He uses the language of race quite often, although in very loose terms since genetics were not really part of the way he looked at things. But rather, it was a, the, think of the richness of humanity, to borrow a later metaphor, as a symphony. And you don't want the violins playing the same line as the flutes, playing the same line as the cello, you know, fill in the blank. That there was the richness of individual uh, nations and this natural, what he calls, differentiation of mankind into separate races or nations right, that actually 
give humanity its full glory. Um, and this was, there were, there were three elements that contributed to this. Number one, his experience, the question that arose for him, the Damascus blood level, like, hey, wait a minute, maybe my universal isn't going to help the Jews. Number two, the collapse of what people expected to be a revolution in Europe in 1848 into basically the rise of a much more oppressive state. And three, he began to learn about um, Italian nationalism. He's very much moved by Mazzini and ultimately Garibaldi, if people are familiar with Italian nationalism. Right? But he saw a nationalism and he started to say, well, if the Italians can do this for themselves, then how come the Jews can't do it as well? Which is why the next big phase, and what we need to spend the rest of the next you know, sort of 20 minutes or so talking about, the, the next big phase of Hess's life is centers around his great work, which is known as Rome and Jerusalem, or what he calls the last national question. So I want to lay out the Rome and Jerusalem, use it to sort of fit the pieces of his progress together, and then we'll close it out with your admission. I'm going to do that. Uh, if Mike? people have questions, they can write them down on the side. Yeah. Sure. I was just going to ask, uh, the notion that he had before the Jews were the primary capital, well, not primary capitalists, but capitalists and standing in the way of progress and so on, is that disappearing at this point? Or is it just kind of incorporated? Yeah, he's, he's, no, he does tshuva. Listen, just listen. He, Mamashi, he literally does tshuva, right? Um, the, he says, so Roman Jerusalem, he publishes it in 1862. It's called Roman Jerusalem because he's interested in Italian nationalism. This is the year that Garibaldi tried to actually incorporate Rome into the Italian Republic he's struggling to create and to keep in, in, uh, in, in being, for lack of a better word. To understand the nationalism which is dominating the world in 1862, it's not just Garibaldi. This is the same year that Otto von Bismarck gives his iron and blood speech, if people are familiar with the history of German nationalism. That was really, Bismarck is ultimately the one that will bring the German state into being, and the blood, the iron and blood speech is like kind of the beginning of that. Also in America, 1862, Civil War has just gotten started. You know, America as a nation state, as opposed to a collection of states, is really coming into being. Nationalism is now seen to be the rising organizing principle for groups of people. And, and Roman Jerusalem is written uh, in the form of 12 letters that are addressed to a woman in grief of the loss of her relative, but it's basically one part description of the conditions of the Jews in the West and a diagnosis of their problems, and one part personal confession. And that's what speaks to what you're asking, Chuck. Because in it, Hess says he's basically living, he's living his life in a dream. And it was only in 1840, with that charge of ritual murder in Damascus, that he suddenly realized where the truth lay. Here's a quote for you. It dawned on me for the first time in the midst of my socialist activities that I belonged to my unfortunate, slandered, despised, and dispersed people, right? Um, and he basically says that he had stifled his cry of pain over his Jewish existence because of the greater sufferings of the European proletariat, which he thought he should devote his life to. But here I am, he says, after 20 years of estrangement in the midst of my people. I take part in its days of joy and sorrow, its memories and hope, its spiritual struggles within its own house, right? And he goes on to say that, that the eternal city, Jerusalem, the birthplace of the belief in the divine unity of life and the future brotherhood of all men is now his guiding light. Notice, Jerusalem represents the particularist Jewish home, but it also is the future brotherhood of all men because he goes on to articulate a vision that, that true internationalist thought begins with the nation state. And it's important today, nationalism is seen as a conservative, small c of course, right? Conservative force, which you know, the liberal and cosmopolitan world claims is preventing unification of the planet. In Hess's day, nationalism was serving in many cases as a liberal force. It was breaking up the multinational empires which were based, in his opinion, on oppression and was liberating peoples, right? This is that Wilson, the Wilsonian notion of self-determination. So Hess in Jerusalem, sorry, in Roman Jerusalem, identifies many of the fundamental problems that later Zionists will see as well. Number one, he says that the denial of nationality, of particularism, that underlays Western Jewry's attempts at emancipation 
does nothing except forfeit the respect of the other nations. Right? The, 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 the assimilation is not a solution. It's critical, right? This is a, a notion which is going to be important for us as we move forward in the story of Zionism. He even goes so far as to condemn the reform movement. We haven't spoken about the reform movement because we jumped out of the flow of history to get to Zionism. But he condemns the reform movement amongst German Jews, which is its origin, and calls it right an emptiness in Jewish life, with his willingness to break off boughs from the Jewish tree, with a shameful lack of pride its leaders tell the Jews to conceal themselves amongst the other nations. He says the modern liberal Jew is to be despised with his fine words about humanity and enlightenment, intended only to disguise his disloyalty to his brothers. He's, he's basically, this is really answering your question, Chuck, he's, he's taking himself to task, the culture which produced him, and he's pointing out that the idea of reforming Judaism in order to join into European society is not only not going to work, but it's a corruption which actually he's going to fight against. He instead actually says that um, the reform movement attempted to free the Jewish people on foreign soil, basically by watering Judaism down. On the, he says, on the other hand, Hasidut, he sees it as a genuine development of Jewish religion, and therefore that's where the future of the Jews will come from. It's an amazing thing for a secular socialist in Western Europe to identify the Hasidim as the sort of real future of Judaism. Um, he's got an incredible quote. He says, the rigid crust of orthodoxy that stunts the progress of Eastern Jewry. And in this sense, he's a classic Western Jew who we'll see again and again in Zionism. to look to Eastern Jewry, Jewry in, in, in Eastern Europe as this sort of um, much more natural, organic expression of Jewish life. So he says, the rigid crust of orthodoxy that stunts the progress of Eastern Jewry will be melted and the sparks of national feeling that smolder beneath it are kindled into the sacred fire which heralds the new spring and the resurrection of their nation into a new life, right? And he says, even though he's rejected his religion, that he would rather keep all the 613 mitzvot and have one day in the Edrin meeting in Jerusalem. Until then, the Jews must preserve what they possess, their authentic spiritual heritage, unmodified, right? Because he's... he's gone 180 degrees on the religious question, even though not in his personal life. He doesn't actually adopt religious practice. He's, gone, he's come to realize that the abandonment of, of um, authentic, historically authentic Judaism, right, is actually counterproductive to what he sees as nationalism as the solution to the Jewish problem. By the way, you can imagine this is not well received by the leadership of the, the reform movement in Germany. We're, we're, again, there's only so much we can do in the discussion of Zionism. Yeah, Mindy, you got a question? Yeah, just quickly. Do you think that that would have been a function of him comparing, like, uh, were the, to him the reform movement was more representational of the sort of trappings of success and capitalism and whatnot, like, as opposed to, like, the Hasidim at the time, uh, more that more simple, so, humble identification with or, you know, that's, I think it's part of it. I mean, it. if you can find a con. It, but, but a deeper level, I think you have to remember, at a deeper level, he's still a, um, a philosophical idealist. And he believes that um, the, the, there's a, there's a essential spirit which drives the national collective. Mm -hmm. And he sees Hasidu as, as expressive of that Jewish spirit, whereas the reform movement, all these assimilationist mm -hmm. instincts are actually abandoning mm -hmm the genuine Jewish spirit and attempting to imitate what they are not. So Gold had a question, what was the turning point? So, so Hess identifies himself the turning point as the Damascus blood libel and a realization that, that even the, the liberal progressive um, elements of, of Europe assumed that a blood libel could be true. We spoke about that last week. But also the collapse of all hopes of the 1848 revolution, right? which forced him to reevaluate this sort of idea that cosmopolitanism, that there's gonna be a universal human revolution and say that no, the real solution is internationalism. Meaning you have to have nations before you can have internationalism, right? And he says history, he breaks with Marx. He doesn't, he rejects Marx's notion that history of all society is 
that of class struggle. And he actually says history is dominated by the struggle, not only of classes, but races and nations as well. He is the first person to see a national solution to the Jewish problem, or at least to put it into writing, in all fairness. We don't know who the first person to see it. And he does point out, by the way, that it's a diseased form of nationalism that seeks to dominate others, right? But nevertheless, Jews, like other people, need a normal national life in order to relate the world. And he says over and over again in the book, without soil, a man sinks to the status of parasite feeding on others. Right? The, the, the only way to have national life is to have soil, and that that soil is unquestionably to him in the land of Israel, what he calls Palestine. He goes through in many places how, the, how basically Jews are made patriots by their very religion. He talks about his grandfather weeping as he reads you know, uh, the book of Jeremiah. He talks about how that, that, uh, that when his grandfather showed him olives and dates, that came from Eretz Israel, how his face would shine, how Jews would strive to get dirt from the land of Israel to be put under their head when they were buried. Um, but he says very clearly that, um, that this, type of, uh, this uh, type of Jewish nationalism, which is a bit of an anachronism, but I think it's a fair statement, isn't going to come from the assimilated Jews of, of Western Europe. It will come from the Hasidim of Eastern Europe, who even though seem like they are less advanced and progressive, they're more authentic to the spirit, the natural spirit of the Jews, right? So Roman Jerusalem is, is, is a big work and there's more in it, but for our purposes, you need to understand that it had no impact in its day. Published in 1862, to basically complete silence, except for the heads of the reform movement who vehemently attack it for a very brief period until they realized nobody was paying attention anyway, right? So, so I'll make a conclusion in a couple of minutes, but um, I, questions or comments, things people want clarified before I wrap this up in the last five minutes. Yeah, Mike. Yep. Yeah. Just one, well, comment or question. I mean, I guess it could be either. I wonder what he would think of the post-Zionist young Israeli movement of uh, returning to Berlin and kind of doing a little twist on cafe society, you know, going over there, like right. being entrepreneurs and artists. And you know, so I wonder what he would, uh, yeah. it's kind of interesting. It, it, it almost, it's yeah, almost it's, a Listen, there's... Yeah, there's certain cycles I think that return, they return again and again. But notice that's again expressive yeah. of the kind of, of the, the tension which I began with, which between the universal and the particular. Yeah. Hess remains a socialist yeah. through his dying day. His vision is a universalist vision, but he understands the mechanism as Jewish national rebirth, and that it's only Jewish national rebirth which will allow the Jews to achieve their actual vision which is universal redemption. Because in, in this, I guess with your guys' permission, maybe, oh, here's a couple of other questions. Um, I would say he didn't reconcile, I have to see this comment from Golda, he didn't reconcile his Judaism with his socialism because I think of Judaism as a religion and he, he remained secular in his behavior. He, 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 I would say he reconciled his Jewish nationalism with his socialism. He, and really what he did was he, recognized, he reconciled the particular and the universal. And then, and then I want to explain um, as, a, um, as a conclusion here. I got about five minutes left. So with your permission, we'll wrap it up. And I appreciate people's patience, by the way. I know this has not been from a technical standpoint the easiest class to follow. Um, I am recording it, though, so I will put it up so if you want to hear it again. Um, well, no, you, Jewish nationalism is not a form of Judaism in the sense that I'm making the distinction that Judaism is religious life. And Jewish nationalism is, uh, is far larger than that. This is part of the larger question that we're getting to. So I'll, I'll answer that in my conclusion here. So, okay. So we have um, Moshe Hess, who basically goes through this process of having come from the Orthodox 
particularist, very small c conservative tradition, moving into the stance of radical Jew, who tries to strip away his particularism in pursuit, as he says, of the liberation of the, the masses, suffering masses of Europe, right? And ultimately, he does tshuva, literally, in returning to himself on some level, in reclaiming his particular identity. It's important, though, to, to appreciate the fact that his vision is universalist, but it's not cosmopolitan. And that's the key of understanding what he adds to our discussion, is that his way of reconciling the particular and the universal was to say that the mission of the Jewish people is universal, but its success depends upon its particular embodiment as a nation in its land. Right? In general, his philosophy moves from international socialism to a view that true internationalism needs nations, right? Um, because internationalism was a movement to harmonize nations, not to abolish them. And so therefore, his vision of a nation state for the Jews, which was a keystone for bringing a socialist society into being, is going to have a deep influence going forward on what's known ultimately as labor Zionism, as we'll speak about it. And um, there's two points I want to end on. Number one, this is a critical insight which he consciously or unconsciously came to about the Torah in general, is that the Torah offers a, um, a different form of universalism to humanity. Most of the universalisms of the 19th and 20th century were homogenizing forces. Everybody should be the same, and that's how we'll have equality. That it's the differences which lend themselves to inequality and injustice. Hess's vision was much more on the, uh, the, the vision of the Torah, which is, no, 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 particularism is a reality, and you don't get rid of it. Universalism is a harmonization of the pieces into a whole, not a homogenization. And therefore, he ultimately puts forward the national solution to the Jewish people as a keystone to the universal vision of redemption. That's one piece I want you to have clear, and you'll see that contributes a lot to this day. Zionism is a, is a visionary force, and, and elements within certainly the, the left liberal parts of Zionism still speak about a universal redemptive, secular redemptive vision. The other piece I'll just note, because it relates to the whole history of Zionism, is that some of the predictions that Hess makes about life in Jewish German life um, are actually downright frightening. Because he says again and again that the Germans are anti-Jewish on a racial basis. Right? Um, he says, what the Germans hate is not so much the Jewish religion or Jewish names as Jewish noses. This is the point at which racial theory is beginning to make real inroads. And of course, in a final chilling passage, it's not the final, but it's in a chilling passage, he says that liberal Jews of Germany will one day suffer a cataclysm, the extent of which they cannot begin to conceive. And this is the other piece that Hess, I think, contributes to the development of Zionism is not just the recognition that there has to be some reconciliation between Jewish life and the universal values that both enlightened Europe and he believes the Torah preach, socialism for him, but there also has to be recognition that the situation of the Jewish people within Europe and particularly within Western Europe is highly unstable. And the assimilation approach attempt to just be accepted is actually making it worse and not better. All right, that's a lot today, but it's 1245 and I think I'll let you guys digest. Um, once again, to the extent that I'm responsible, I apologize for the technical challenges here. Um, and I would ask everyone, I will put up the recording of this as soon as I can, and it will go up and it'll be out there. People can be in touch with me by email if they've got questions or comments.